Hi, everyone. Um, please, if you do want to stand up for a second, you can. If not, I'm going to get going. My name is Siobhan. I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about an, the IOC Sport Mental Health Assessment Tool. Um, but before we get into this, I do want to thank AMSSM um, for sending us overseas. Thank you. <laughs> Now, despite his highest efforts to get us to dress in white for the cricket, uh, we, he has been phenomenal um, as a host. So thank you, Mark. Um, thank you to Axis for having us here tonight. And then I'd also like to thank my two fellows that I've been traveling with. It's been wonderful so far and can't wait for the remainder of the, of the adventures coming up. So um, I do have nothing to disclose, but I will say up front that I'm a huge fan of this course. It's called the IOC Diploma in Mental Health in Elite Sport course. I drank the Kool-Aid about a couple of years ago when I heard Ma Margot Mountjoy give a talk about how we were dealing with this problem of mental health, problem, uh, mental health disorders and symptoms, and we weren't being able to address it. Uh, this was back in about 2016, 2017. So I went ahead, I signed up for this course, which is worldwide. And I was able to do it virtually. And then you complete the course with a diploma, which looks great on your wall. But as a GP in America, I felt like I was a very naturally, my personality led to being decent at mental health assessment of patients. But it took my level from here all the way up to here. So again, if you guys have the interest, um, it is something that you will use in your practice. And I hope you'll use it more so after tonight's talk. All right, so there it is, and there'll be more to come. Now, I don't know if you guys heard Margo. Margo was talking about how they say things in Boston. For those of you guys who have been to Boston, they have this awesome, awful accent. And so people in Boston say wicked smat. Um, we're not going to be talking about wicked smat people today. We're going to be talking about the smat. So the letters are rearranged a little bit. It's the S-M-H-A-T, not smat. Um, all right, so today... Here is going to be our sprint. We're going to have four stops and possibly a fifth. Um, what are we talking about? How did it come about? What does it entail? And is it feasible? Now, I know I'm talking to an audience of doctors and physios. Um, and so I'm going to be hopefully making it um, a little bit more applicable. But I always believe that in order to understand something, you have to understand the history behind it. So we need to talk about two major things. What is mental health? And you have a lot of words over in the far left-hand corner. I'm going to read it for you. This is mental health. Mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can, hope, can cope with the normal stressors of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. All right, so that's mental health. That's when things are going really well. But when things start to decline a little bit, you begin to develop mental health symptoms and disorders. So as defined by the American Psychiatric Association in 2013, this, is, this implies significant changes in thinking, emotion, and or behavior that occurs over time, resulting in distress and or problems functioning in social work or family activities. Very different. So we deal with a very athletic population in general, people who, who like sport. So we're really good at fixing the physical. We're really good at addressing the knee and the shoulder. But that's only the physical component of health. That's only part of it. We need to address the mental component too. An athlete who is, who is healthy mentally and physically, they're great. A patient, an athlete who is physically well and mentally not well is not great. Think of it as the flip. Somebody who's mentally well but physically not there's work to do, so we need to become better versed. So mental health in athletes, though, elite athletes, there's, now you're at putting them into a pressure cooker. There's even more contributing to the stressors that they're being berated with. So things such as playing time or poor athletic performance or even exposure to harassment, which we're hearing more and more about. All right, so what happens when this beautiful mental health begins to disintegrate. And if we take a closer look, you can see that it, this is a huge spectrum of things that can be contributing. You've got things such as ADHD, overtraining, personality issues, a lot of chemical imbalances. Um, and so this is where we need a better method to screen to help our athletes. We're, we're getting good at coming up with the Lockman exam for the ACL, but we need methods to start looking a little bit more at mental health. We want something ideally to be standardized that you guys can use here and we can use in North America. Um, we want to be able to identify when somebody's beginning to slip early. 
so that we can intervene and get them back. The longer somebody goes on, it's going to be delving into a rabbit hole, and so we want to be able to correct that sooner. We want something, too, that we can look and be like, ah, oh, there's a problem, and I can come in right here and fix this. So something that is intervenable, and then something that is clinically useful, something that's feasible. All right, and enter the SMAT. All right, how did it come about? Uh, the International Olympic Committee in 2017 decided we needed to address this. Margot's picture is up there. She was part of the expert panel who tasked with reviewing the scientific uh, literature on mental health symptoms and disorders. And they were asked to look at the prevalence, the diagnostics of this, as well as management, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. Additionally, they were asked to present recommendations to minimize the negative impacts of the sporting environment on these mental health symptoms and disorders. So they came out with a consensus statement. It came out in 2019. And in this paper, which is a really helpful and useful paper, uh, well worth reading for anybody who is involved in clinical care, um, within, embedded in it, they have areas identified for, for future areas of research. But one of the needs that they found was the need to appropriately screen for mental health symptoms and disorders. Out of this large group, they narrowed it down to 11 individuals who then were tasked with reviewing over 14,000 documents, interviewing previous and current elite athletes, getting their attitudes and their, their stories on mental health. And what they found from these athletes is that two thirds of them felt very uncomfortable talking to their coaches, talking within their sporting environment about any struggles that they were having and that 90% of them supported coming up with a method to screen. So they came, the, the task, the mental health working group came up with two screening forms, and one of them is the SMAT, but there's another one called the SMIRT. So what's the difference? The SMIRT is the Sport Mental Health Recognition Tool, S-M-H-R-T. This is for the athlete entourage, this is for the friends of the athlete. This is for fellow athletes, families, coaches, somebody who realizes that, hey, you know what? My teammate, there's something going on. So it's a, it's a screening form that they can go through and identify, hey, there's a problem here. You need to get the help from somebody who's going to be able to help you a little bit more. So then they get over to the sport mental health assessment tool, which should be done by medical professionals or those in the medical field. So SMIRT, non-medical, SMAT, medical. Um, it's usually, uh, anybody of the medical team can, can conduct it, but if there's going to be any intervention, that has to be done by the sport medicine physician or, a, or the licensed mental health professional. All right, what does it entail? This is, it's, it's really quite easy. You can Google it, you can download it, you can print it. This is what it looks like. And what I'm gonna be specifically doing is showing you and talking through this algorithm right here. Um, essentially, it's three stages. Number one, we're gonna triage this individual. Number two, we're gonna screen, do some screening tests. And number three, we're gonna do some action, some brief or more in-depth intervention. So if at each stage, everything is going really well and the athlete seems healthy and good, it's a green light, they can keep going. But if there are concerns along the way, then it's a yellow light and you're prompted to ask more questions. All right, so it's essentially a stoplight system. All right, step one, so this is the very top. So right over there, I've blown that up. For this, we use a test called the APSQ, the Athlete Psychological Strain Questionnaire. And this assesses sport-related psychological distress. So for example, and it tells you exactly, over the past 30 days, have you been feeling, and for those of you guys that over there, I'll read you a couple, I was less motivated. I found training to be more stressful. So you can see there are five columns. The lowest score you can rate yourself is not, not none of the time rather, and you get one point, all the way up to all the time, which is five points. So you sum this up. So the lowest point score that you could get out of these 10 questions is 10. The highest is 50. What they found out through further, further evaluation is that the cutoff score was 17. So this was found to be a valid score separation. So anybody who scores less than 17, that's a green light, 
and they're good. So they're under normal but lower psychological stress. However, if somebody is 17 or above, that's when there needs to be a little bit more concern. They move on to step two. So we're done with step one. Step two, screening. Screening involves six different types of tests. And it looks for anxiety, depression, eating, sleep disturbance, alcohol, and drug misuse. And then what you want to do is as this individual is taking these tests, you're keeping a running score. So the running score is on this form right here. I said six tests. There are seven columns. And I'll talk to you about that in just one second. Depression is split up into two. So the first one, anxiety. Here we use the generalized anxiety disorder seven, so or the GAD seven, to ask about symptoms that they've had in the past two weeks. Again, if they score under a 10, they're good. If they score over a 10, it flips them from a green zone into a yellow zone. Similarly for depression, here we use the PHQ-9, so it was a total of nine questions. Again, if somebody has a lot of symptoms, their score is going to be higher. So if the score is over 10, it's going to kick them into the yellow zone. Now, I don't know if any of you guys use the PHQ-9 on a regular basis in clinic, but there's a, there's a question at the bottom that should always raise concern. And that question is, do you ever want to hurt yourself? Are you thinking about hurting yourself, essentially? Or can, would you be better off dead? If you score any point at all, that aborts the test. That's a red light, you stop. All right. Um, so th therefore, back on this form, you've been keeping track. You've got the, the anxiety, you've got depression, but you've also got this one question, which if they tested, if they said that they wanted to hurt themselves, you stop the test immediately. All right. So a few more tests. We, we look for, at, for uh, sleeping disturbance. And for this, we use the athlete's sleep screening questionnaire, which is a series of five questions. We also ask about alcohol use, which can be pretty prominent. And here we use the audit C, which stands for alcohol use disorders, identification consumption. We use drugs. And for this, we use the cage aid, which is cutting down. You get annoyed by criticism. You feel guilty. And you use it as an eye opener. And this can be adapted to drugs. So the second portion of this is, have you ever used any of these substances and it's created a problem in your life over the past three months? So are you guys beginning to understand a little bit? We're, we're searching a little bit more into these, each of these silos that contribute to mental health. And then lastly, we have eating dis uh, disordered eating. Here we use the beta Q, brief eating disorder in athletes questionnaire. All right, so now, as somebody has gone through, you're checking off their score. Okay, this per they scored a two here, they're good. They scored, oh, they scored an 11 with depression, but they don't want to hurt themselves. But everything else is green. So what do we do with one yellow? Well, all of them have to be green in order to be good. But if somebody scores a yellow in anything, you're going to move on to the next step. Of course, if the depression question number nine was read, that's, you've already stopped the test. All right, so that's the screening portion. Lastly, we have action. Um, if the six screening tests are good, you still have them in your office. You can give them a little bit of counseling, give them something. So do a brief intervention. Um, you can talk to them about mindfulness or meditation or stress control. You can talk to them about the Calm app to help them go to sleep. Just give them a little pointer because you have them in the room. Um, if, though, somebody tests yellow for something, you want to do a clinical assessment and management. This is where you want to really dig. Is there a problem here? So this should be completed by a sports medicine physician or a licensed mental health professional. And it's super important to understand that if somebody scores a yellow on these tests, that does not indicate it's, a diagnost it's diagnostic. It means that it raises the concerns for this and is worth following up with a, with a physician to determine whether they do indeed have that condition. All right, here you can identify important problems. You can intervene. You can look at previous screening tests. You can also ask at this time, are you getting harassed? What is going on with your sport? You're not the same person. You know, I, I'm concerned about you. Let's talk a little bit more. And you also want to do a comprehensive assessment because very often anxiety does not exist by itself. Anxiety is often intertwined with depression. 
And when somebody's anxious and depressed, they oftentimes can't eat very well or they can't sleep well. So it becomes much more complex. It's just not a clean, pretty identification. So what I also like to point out with this form is on the very back of it, there's, there's an additional battery of tests that if you are maybe not quite feeling that, that everything has been identified, there are additional tests that test for ADHD, bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorder, gambling, and psychosis. And this is all in a nine-page, very easy to follow document off of Google, off of the IOC website. All right, so we've gone through that. Is it feasible? I mean, it's taken me 10 minutes to explain it to you. It's a little dry, I understand. But if you walk through it with somebody, is, it, is, is that realistic in our practice? Um, well, Dr. Margot Mountjoy decided to take a closer look at this. She used it in her university setting in Ontario, Canada. There she had a cohort of 550 athletes that spread across 17 sports. Um, the screenings were done online, but this was done during COVID. So we need, to, I, we need to look at the data a little bit more clearly. Now, this is a little bit of a complex slide. You'll see over on the left, there's T0, T1, T2, time zero, time one, time two. Time zero was in October of 2020, and it was in the middle of the semester. T1 was in January, so winter break had finished. Classes had not picked up yet. And then T2 was later in the semester, kind of when they were approaching finals. We're not going to go through all of the findings, but I do want to pick out, show you a few things. Out of a total of 550, the initial response rate was phenomenal. It was 98%. 543 out of 550, that was a really good response rate. But as the year went on, or as the study went on, it dropped down to 336 and then eventually down to 133 with a major predominance towards female athletes responding at the very end. So what can we, what can we garner from this? So taking a look at the APSQ, remember this is what looks at psychological strain. First of all, values were way higher than, than what were to be expected. And if you take a look, T0 was about mid-20s, and then it jumped up to nearly 40, and then back down into the 30s. So what happened here? I mean, what they're thinking is that first fall semester of competition, they were still practicing with their teammates. There was no competition, but they were in the university setting playing their sport with their team. Then due to COVID, they were not allowed to return to even practice together and many of these university students were sent home. So it, it, we have to take this because it was, it was implemented at a time when COVID was really changing the world. Um, so could it have been due to the cancellation of sports? Then the GAD7, the PHQ9, um, just taking a look at those um, high numbers, but now here, T1, which is during January, the values dropped. So anxiety and depression, what could that be due to? Well, could it be the timing of the academic pressures? Because T0 and T2 were right in the middle of the semester. So they were studying for midterms and they were studying for, for finals. Additionally, rates were higher than previous years. So could it have been COVID like we just talked about? So this was the first time it was implemented. There are clearly some limitations to this. The IOC advocates for repeated use over a single sport season just to monitor that individual. And they were able to do that here. It was the first time that this tool was used in this fashion. It was used online. Uh, it provided insight into the mental health of these athletes and it was able to be completed. So it was feasible. So now what we're hoping is that there is a tool that is available to the public that we can be, begin to use and have as a resource, even just having it printed out in one's clinic. So final thoughts, we do need to go there. We need to acknowledge, we need to ask. We're often the people working with these athletes. We know them really, really well. We know when they're off. Take that extra second to ask. Familiarize yourself with the test and there is definitely a call for um, more research. Take interest, look into it a little bit. Um, and hopefully we can begin to address you know, the, the stressors and the concerns. Um, and then this is the information uh, for the IOC diploma course. If you are at all interested, it's very easy. If you type in IOC diploma course mental health, it takes you straight to that page. Um,
Awesome. Thank you.